So hi, everyone. Welcome to our virtual meet and greet. We're so excited to be here tonight and have you all here and for you to meet DRC's new leadership. 2021 is a new year, thank goodness, and we are excited to see all the new things that are happening in our community, including these new leaders. So I'm going to start out basically just offering this time for introductions. You've sent in your questions and we're so grateful. Um, they're great and wonderful and we're going to address those, but I'm going to start here by just having each of our panelists introduce themselves. So this is DRC's 2021 leadership, I should say 2021 to I, I'll, I'll say five years. No, I don't know. I won't put you in any contracts, but this is our new leadership team. And I'm going to start with Dr. Cerulli, um, and he's going to introduce himself, not only his background, but all three of the panelists are also going to share how and why they're connected to DRC. So Vincenzo, take it away. Thank you, Casey. Uh, okay, I'll introduce briefly myself. Uh, my name is Vincenzo Cerulli. Uh, I am an associate professor at the University of Washington. And just to backtrack a little bit, to give you a little background uh, of how I got here, I trained originally as an endocrinologist and I used to see type 1 diabetic patients. And uh, over the years, I became somewhat unsatisfied of what was happening. We are talking some 35 years ago. So that's when I uh, left Italy, where I got my MD degree, and went to Switzerland, where I discovered my true passion, which is understanding the molecular mechanisms that regulate the development and function of the cells that produce insulin in your pancreas, that which we call the beta cells, part of these clusters of cells that uh, uh, we call also pancreatic islets that you probably know. Uh, and after six years uh, in training there, uh, I got my PhD in pancreatic islet biology and I moved to Southern California where I spent 17 years at UCSD uh, when I met Dr. Alberto Ayak, who has been uh, my mentor and friend for many years. And that's how I got uh, involved with uh, the effort that DRC has uh, launched a few years ago. Um, and it, just about 12 years ago, I moved here because my desire to expand uh, further my involvement in type 1 diabetes research, uh, what I found attractive, attractive right here uh, was the uh, opportunity to work with stem cells. Uh, in fact, my lab here is hosted by the so-called Institute of Stem Cell and Regenerative, Medic Regenerative Medicine, uh, where we conduct studies on, the, uh, uh, on ways to improve the uh, derivation of insulin producing cells from stem cells. And uh, I'll stop there for a further discussion later. Yeah, thank you, Vincenzo. And Vincenzo is our scientific director. Um, so he will get to share a little bit about that, but really overseeing our exciting applicants, uh, our early career scientists who are receiving funding from DRC. And I think I forgot to mention because I was so excited to introduce our panelists. I'm Casey Davis, uh, Senior Director of Development for Diabetes Research Connections. So again, welcome. All right, we are going to go to the introduction for Karen Hooper, our new Executive Director. So Karen, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Casey. Hi, everybody. It's so good to be with you. Um, I'm Karen Hooper, and I have been the executive director for the DRC for about 60 days now, um, and I'm really thrilled to be here. I've spent my career um, really focused on healthcare access and making sure that people with all kinds of chronic diseases get the access they need, and as we work toward funding for a care for different diseases. So started my career um, in nonprofit with the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Association. Um, I actually met my husband at MDA camp. Um, and then I moved on to working with the MS community, multiple sclerosis, and serving in um, that organization for about 20 years. And just last year was able to move um, out of that organization and start to think about what opportunities I might want to do in my career next when I realized this awesome opportunity um, at Diabetes Research Connection. And I was really excited to think about joining an organization who was so young and growing and deeply committed, founded by donors and scientists together to really find a cure um, and address prevention issues and quality of life for the diabetes community. So I've spent my career in nonprofit and I'm so excited to be able to uh, join the diabetes community and really start to learn and engage with all of you. So thank you for welcoming me so, so far and I can't wait to meet you all. Thank you, Karen. And last, I'm going to introduce Dr. King, who is our new DRC 
chair, the chair of our board. Hi, everybody. My name is C.C. King, and I am a principal scientist at Novartis, specifically the Genomics Institute of the Novartis Research Foundation here in San Diego. Uh, prior to joining Novartis two and a half years ago, I was an associate professor at UCSD, the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, prior to that, I, like Vincenzo, had become um, involved in the type one community almost 20 years ago through Alberto Hayek and his passion and vision. Um, so I have remained active in the type one community, despite my research and my lab um, moving on from that. Um, I, at um, Novartis, I work on a number of things, including diabetes. I am personally affected by it. I have family members who are type one diabetic. I have friends who are type one diabetic. So I understand both the science behind it from my work in stem cell biology, as well as in islet biology, and the personal side of it, the daily grind, all of the problems that people have, and just coping with life with type one. So I understand it from both areas, as well as most of the people here. Um, I became involved with um, DRC at the very beginning. Again, um, when Alberto and David first set out to form this organization, both Nigel Calcutt and I were at the table and have been active participants. And it was all of us sitting down to try to help shape that vision that resulted in what DRC is. The people who are sitting here next to me, Casey, Karen, and Vincenzo, have all taken the kernel of knowledge that David and Ni Nigel and Alberto and I kind of had and have grown it into what you see before you. So we are now poised to try to move forward and we want to do this with all of you. We want to have uh, input from the community. We want to interact. We want to use the connection part of Diabetes Research Connection to understand what, not just the science, but help understand how the community uh, reacts and how what the community needs. So with that, I'll stop prattling on for the moment and hand it back over to Casey and do some interactive things. Thank you, Cece. So that is our wonderful leadership team. And so we're gonna dive in with questions now. I wish that I could hear it say, give a round of applause and we could all clap, but that will come shortly, right? Where we can actually have energy from each other and not be staring at a screen. Okay, so the first question is for all three of you. So whoever would like to jump in, um, I, if you wanna raise your hand, I can call on you or you can just jump in whatever you would like. Um, but we received a lot of questions actually, multiple questions about where DRC is headed. Where are we going? I think a lot of people are asking in 2021, what's next? <laughs> and you know what, that's a great question for DRC, especially with this awesome new team. So the questions are, there's a few of them, but really the general question is what are your personal plans or DRC's plans for the next 100 days, making DRC an even better supporter of the T1D community? And with that, how will you expand the effect of DRC as a facilitator of T1D research? And this one says in the next two to five years. Um, so I'm gonna kind of narrow it down and say in the next, we'll say in the future. Um, so we'll leave it a little more open-ended. So really where do you see DRC heading in the future in regards to expanding the T1D research field, contributing to it? And do you have any other thoughts of how we can connect with the T1D community? So who would like to start? I might have to tap you in. <laughs> Casey, I'll start. Okay. Um, great, thank you. So these are great questions. Um, and I think one of the first things I would say, it really piggybacks onto what CC started to say, the connection part of diabetes research connection. And having spent my career really focused on how to build community and bring people together to support one another, um, it, I think that's a huge opportunity for the organization moving forward, figuring out ways of which we wanna communicate and connect as a group and how we'll do that. Um, 
the other thing that I think is really um, personally interesting and exciting to me as a leader of this organization moving forward is really thinking about how I can better um, immerse myself and learn and connect with as many people in the T1D community as possible. So as Cece shared, I after um, taking the role here, I definitely started hearing from many people that I'm friends with and relatives who I had no idea um, lived with T1D. And now that they know that I work here, they're sharing their experiences with me. And I personally believe that nothing is more valuable than hearing those experiences firsthand to be able to lead us forward. So I think for myself personally, um, we're going to get organized. We're going to continue to organize as an organization and figure out what our community needs. Um, and then personally, I really want to meet as many people living with type 1 diabetes as possible and hear from you what's on your mind, what's on your heart, um, and what you're looking for from your diabetes research connection. So um, those are a few thoughts for me for the most immediate future, but um, Vin, maybe you want to take a stab at um, the research side and what you're thinking about for the scientific review committee and, and where we're going there. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, on behalf of every scientist involved in our organization, from uh, all the way from our internal review team to the over 80 or so scientists that are helping us identify the best science that, the, that we receive uh, as proposals. Uh, our goal is really look, this, look at the science, see what is the progress and where we see a niche that can push the field forward. Uh, because as of today, uh, a, a, a truly a recurrent question that I get all the time, even here, is when do we have a cure? When will we have a cure? Uh, when is uh, my child uh, uh, going to be able to live without daily injections? So uh, what I would like to uh, say uh, uh, in response to, uh, to that question is that, and that is a question that I get also from uh, family members, I have relatives also with type 1 diabetes, is that you can possibly put a timetable on this because, the, uh, because of the complexity of the disease, how it starts, how it evolves, how you can treat it better, and how you can eventually cure it. Uh, but the horizon is bright, I think, uh, especially considering the fast-paced uh, uh, research that not only us, but also other organizations are funding. Uh, but I think we have a unique opportunity as an organization that is growing in identifying uh, areas that perhaps uh, uh, the NIH or other organizations are not focusing a lot right now. And uh, our goal for now is uh, to really identify young scientists that can propel us uh, and they can think out of the box and can put forward some new ideas. And uh, we received quite a few of those so far. And I think we are doing really well. Some of those investments that we made over the past uh, a couple of years, they are already given, uh, giving some uh, great results uh, with uh, publication in top journals. And uh, as of a few days, we heard of new research coming out of uh, DRC-funded research. And there are a lot of fronts that we can uh, uh, explore together uh, as part of this discussion. Uh, but on top of my list, I think, if I were to be asked, uh, what do you see as uh, the uh, most exciting research ongoing in the field and which of course we, we plan to uh, support. Uh, certainly the, uh, uh, any research that will address the issue of cell replacement to make sure that a patient uh, will no longer need insulin injection is uh, a top priority for our goals. Uh, at the same time though, we cannot just uh, think of that as a uh, uh, a holy grail and not think of other ways that we can uh, invest on which we can make our uh, the life of our patients better uh, and it just come to mind one of the most successful uh, projects that we just uh, that we funded recently on some uh, effort uh, uh, to develop so-called smart insulins so those are insulins uh, that work only when the euroglycemia is super high, but they will not work when you are uh, at risk of getting 
into a low uh, sugar level, so-called hypoglycemia, which people, I mean, if you talk about hypoglycemia out in the public, people that don't know what diabetes is say, well, what's the big deal? Well, hypoglycemia is perhaps uh, the most dangerous uh, 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 episode that a type 1 diabetic can have. You know, hyper, of course, you, you, you don't feel uh, super well, but you can take care of it with your insulin. But if you are going into a hypo and you look consciousness, that's a, a, a life-threatening situation. So I think that there is a lot of advancement in that front that can certainly uh, address that. And of course, uh, we cannot underestimate for the time being uh, also other areas of research that are being explored by a number of laboratories that uh, one way or another, they are all revolved around cell replacement therapy. And that can be of stem cell origin, of organ donors. And uh, like it or not, there is also significant effort uh, being devoted uh, with uh, the potential use of uh, other uh, sources of tissue from animals. Uh, there are, for instance, uh, many centers that are exploring the, uh, um, the possibility of using uh, engineered pig pancreatic islets. So these are special uh, pig uh, cells which have been rendered uh, uh, suitable uh, to be used in uh, uh, patients. Of course, we will need immunosuppression for that uh, patient receiving those cells, but this is in the works uh, eventually. And uh, lastly, uh, I think uh, in parallel, we are very uh, supportive also of works that will focus on strategies that will take care of the so-called autoimmunity and in potential immune rejection. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy and so somewhat naive to think that if you were to put back a, a pancreatic uh, beta cell in a patient with type 1 diabetic, diabetes will be just, uh, will just solve the problem like that. Well, it's not that easy because that patient has a so-called uh, memory of autoimmunity and most likely will destroy again this beta cell. So we have to come up with strategies that will let us protect these cells so-called immunoregulatory uh, strategies. And there are a lot of labs that are focusing on that. Um, some of that research, I think, is being uh, considered by the DRC for funding. And uh, I think with that, I will leave space also for my colleagues to, uh, to uh, pitch in. Perfect. Thanks, Vincenzo. Um, so I want to um, kind of build upon both what Karen and Vincenzo said. Before I look forward as to what I think we should what I think we should be doing, I want to take a quick step back and talk about what we've done during the pandemic. The pandemic has been absolutely devastating to everybody. And we are incredibly grateful to our supporters and our staff for helping us figure out how to keep funding grants during this time period. Unlike most other organizations, we have been able to not just sustain the number of grants that we've been able to fulfill during the past year. We've actually, we actually funded more grants last year than we have in any year previous. And that's a very exciting thing. And so looking forward, not just 100 days, but in the next year, in the next two years, one of the things that I think is important for us to do is to continue to fund and find the right scientists doing the right projects and make sure that they find the funding that they need. I don't want, I hate to use the word disconnect, but I am going to, because it makes it sound like there's a problem. But one of the things that I think moving forward, we need to do to partner with everybody out there who supports us is better reporting. We need to turn everybody who looks at the projects that have been funded, looks at the reports to see where their money has gone. We need to turn that sort of reporting into excitement about the science. We need to do a better job of conveying the excitement of what's going on in the field with the people who, the, who we're funding. That is a sense of reward that you guys have and will have everyone then feel like they are part of this community and more willing to reach out. Because really, 
when it gets down to the end of the day, this isn't about us. This is about the researchers who are doing work to help cure type one. Now, Kelly also talked, I saw a question pop up in the box from Kelly. Whoa, 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 Cece. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm going to ask that in a second. I know. I'm not going to go there, but I wanted to bring up in this that we do not strictly, we are not looking for cures. We're also looking for care, complication, and prevention. So as we are moving towards this, we are trying to address holistically everybody who's involved in this. I'm also really excited to see in the chat box the number of scientists, not just around the United States, but also apparently around the world who are here. One of the things that we need to do is make this a place to connect. And we need to have DRC be and become a central hub for an exchange of ideas between scientists, mentoring of scientists, and understanding exactly how the community and the scientists can work hand in hand to be able to attack this problem together. Yeah, thank you everyone for that. And you know, I'll add a couple of things and we will get to Kelly's question. She actually said, and delay. So we'll talk about prevention and delay. So I will hand that over to you and Cece and Vincenzo in a, in a minute, but I wanted to just take a moment. First, I wanted to build upon what everybody's saying. Um, and Karen had mentioned how she wants to meet with people in the type one community. So one of the things we'll be doing is coffee with Casey and Karen. It's virtual right now. Um, we wanna make sure that it's completely safe for everyone till we meet in person. But if you're interested in meeting with us and giving us your ideas, we just wanna listen and hear what you think um, we could do and ideas you have and maybe likes or dislikes about the ways that DRC is engaging with, with you all. So feel free, we'll follow up with you after, but um, if you're interested, reach out to me uh, about that anytime. And I wanted to also build, I know that CC was mentioning all that we're doing, what we've done in 2020. And yeah, we were so thrilled to continue to support research and we're hoping to obviously continue to do the same. But we do have a goal this year to be able to translate what we're doing for our entire community. And just like Cece was saying, there are individuals here who understand a lot of the things that are being said and then others who are like, this is my first time um, really actually getting to hear from researchers themselves about the actual research that I'm supporting. So we are really trying and putting so much of our time, energy and efforts and resources um, to be able to really define and break down what we are seeing happen and what the proof of principle, right? What these scientists are establishing through their projects and how exciting it is and how it's impacting the field. So stay tuned as we continue to invest in that area of our programming and we're thrilled to have your feedback on that as well. So before we jump into the that question that was sent by Kelly, thanks again, and please feel free to send questions. We still have a list of questions you sent before uh, this event. So I wanna make sure just to follow up with Karen, I'm gonna ask you a personal question. No, it's not that personal, but this is a get to know you. This is a meet and greet, right? So um, there's some questions around why you decided to work with DRC. What was your background? I know you briefly touched upon um, what where you've come from, but specifically why, I think you mentioned working at the MS Society, but why did you want to work for DRC? Why did you come here? And no, I'm not going to put you on the spot and say, why do you think you're equipped to take us all to places? <laughs> we believe that you are, but specifically around how you are excited to be a part of this and how your background connects with what we're doing. Yeah, thanks, Casey. I was one, I was at my edge of my seat wondering what the personal question was going to be. Um, so I I um, did describe a little bit about my background, but I think um, what I appreciate so much about the question is where we're going. Um, and one of the things that I had to think about as I changed my career at the MS Society um, during COVID was where I wanted to spend the next part of my career. And as I started to think about that, I, I really decided that I definitely wanted to continue to be in service um, and nonprofit. I definitely am made to um, give back to others. It's who I am as a person. Um, and I also knew that I wanted to work for an organization that prioritized some of my key um, focuses as a person as well. So one of those is being innovative and entrepreneurial. And I, I didn't find anyone as I was looking for my next career adventure that demonstrated an, a more uh, a greater commitment to innovation and being entrepreneurial than the DRC. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to be sure I found was to be surrounded by kind people. And um, in the job description um, for this role, one of the things that the board highlighted that they were looking for, in addition to, you know, being strategic and caring about care and caring about the community was they were looking for a kind leader. And it really stood out to me. And I think it's something that stands out greatly about this organization. We really are committed to being innovative. And we really are committed to treating people as people first. Um, and that's the kind of leader I am. And that's the kind of organization I want to be part of. Um, in, in, in regard to connection to type one, as I shared a little bit earlier, my husband also does live with type two diabetes. And although DRC's primary focus is type one, um, the diabetes community is something that our family has definitely started to face over the last couple of years. And so it's been really inspiring also to join an organization where our board and our community is so passionate and committed um, to thinking about how we can find the cure, prevent this disease and make sure that no parent ever has to hear that their child has type 1 diabetes ever again. So um, I think it's a mix of all of those things, Casey, and I'm just really grateful to be welcomed into the family. Well, we are grateful to have you here. I'm thrilled uh, to be working with you and collaboratively and our team is just so excited. So I'm going to dive back into the prevention and delay questions. So Cece and Vincenzo, I'm going to let you take over whoever wants to start. I'm assuming Vincenzo might want to start. I'm seeing him shake his head. So I'm going to let him start with that. Thanks, Casey uh, and Kelly. Thank you for that question. Um, that is a, a, a timely one. As you, I don't know if you heard of, but there was just a recent report uh, by a team of investigators at the University of California in San Diego who identified uh, the uh, involvement of some genes that are expressed in the exocrine pancreas. So that's a, a portion of your pancreas that is responsible for, for the production of uh, uh, enzymes that will digest your uh, food in your, uh, in your gut lumen. Well, they found that some of the genes that the exocrine pancreas uh, are uh, using to function are actually uh, predictors of uh, predisposition to type 1 diabetes. Now, of course, this is a basic research. It was a monumental effort. They sequenced uh, a number, uh, an incredible number of uh, uh, tissue samples from uh, uh, individuals, and they will need uh, some level of, uh, you know, beta testing and uh, further validation. But it's exciting, and that's part of the innovation that we would promote. Uh, in other words, uh, let's uh, look under stones that have never been uh, turned uh, because you know as, as of uh, very recently nobody ever suspected that the exocrine pancreas has anything to do with type 1 diabetes but this uh, exciting new study a study has seemed to suggest that, uh, that it is a partner in crime even the exocrine uh, tissue so we will have to wait to see how that will evolve and how can that be uh, uh, translated into some sort of a test? Because the, the, the interest of that study uh, re, uh, resides in the fact that uh, if you can identify some of those genes that are active in your pancreas, even before you start to have so-called autoantibodies, which so far in the past 20 or so years have been the, the uh, uh, only predictor of uh, kids or patients uh, of a potential uh, undergoing, uh, developing type 1 diabetes, that's huge because at the same time, there is a lot of uh, uh, research ongoing in ways to uh, tune down the immune system and make sure that th that attack doesn't happen. Uh, and uh, in that front, of course, I just want to uh, stress uh, one last thing that uh, circle back to what Karen said and what the CC mentioned as well is that what I think DRC uh, uh, is unique at is it's built into the acronym Diabetes Research Connection. What we do, we connect the dots between the most exciting science and the most prominent young scientists that can uh, take on the challenge, but we also connect that science with potential donors or individuals that are uh, uh, have a, a, a will 
to, to support those type of efforts. And uh, perhaps the CC may uh, build on that. Sure. And I, I agree with everything that Vincenzo just said. Um, the first step in all of this is really the identification of logical markers, be it up and down regulation of genes, be it a secreted protein, whatever it may be, that can be used as a diagnostic. As soon as one can begin to build a diagnostic, one can start to think about then is what that actually means. And if you then have that, you're then able to open up new areas of funding and new areas of research into this. And this is the exact type of place that we like to go because this is considered to be really exploratory, really, really potentially very impactful but likely to fail. And that's where we like to strike our balance is in exactly in that. There are people out there with great ideas, just like saying, hey, we never bothered to look at the exocrine pancreas. Maybe we should do that. Maybe we should look at other organ systems. And when we begin to do that, these are the type of exploratory grants that we get excited about. We want to be involved in this cutting edge type of ideas. We aren't about rehashing these 30, 40 year old ideas that are making slow and steady progress. Don't get me wrong. There is progress being made, but we believe that larger steps can be made and we owe it to the community to be able to fund these. I love how each of you speaks with such conviction and passion. Uh, as you can see, we at DRC really believe in what we do, <laughs> and I'm so grateful to be a part of this team. Um, so I'm going to break up the research questions again. I like doing a little research, a little personal. I know I'm directing all my personal at Karen, but I'm going to do it again. Karen, no, um, I actually was just going to ask. So a lot of individuals are asking how to get involved with DRC. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had people say, I have T1D, my daughter has T1D, my granddaughter has T1D. How do I get involved? I know nothing about research. Um, then there's a nurse and she says she's really interested in learning more. So specifically, how would you tell our community how could they get more involved with DRC, not only serving on the board, you can obviously share that, but they wanna know in general, what are all the different ways that they can get involved with what we're doing? Yes, thank you. So one of the things that's really exciting and um, that I think uh, it will be interesting for the group to hear is that we are going to be actually celebrating our 10 year anniversary as an organization in 2022. And so we're going to be thinking through the next steps for the organization and embarking on our first strategic planning process, which I think is really exciting. And I think what that will help us do in the long term is think about ways that we can engage our volunteer community in all sorts of roles. But most immediately, I would say that Casey and I are excited to meet with anyone who wants to have a conversation about how they can get more involved. Some of the most immediate things you can do would be to really follow us on social media. It's an easy thing. It doesn't take a lot of time. And by following us and engaging and sharing information about gatherings like today, it really starts to build awareness for the organization. And as we want to uncover every opportunity in the research field, as Cece just described, the number one way we're going to be able to do that is by gaining awareness across the country about the work we're doing so that we can engage as many applicants to our research awards and as many supporters of that research as possible. And the only way to do that, and well, the way to start doing that is just to continue to build awareness. So I would ask you again, you know, follow us on social media, share us with your networks, um, and then have let's have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and hear about your passions and how we might plug you into the work. There's always more work that needs to be done then we can accomplish so we love help and uh, we're looking forward to having those conversations with you about how we might do that yeah uh, Karen just to follow on what you just said uh, to build on that what I would like to add is also uh, the fact that uh, following us on social media is of course uh, the uh, one of the most important uh, strategy that anyone can follow to see what's going on uh, but also uh, our newsletters that go regularly out. So please sign up for those. And uh, what is coming your way, uh, I can anticipate in the near future that we have some big plans. Like our, 
one of the basic concept of uh, that Alberto Ayak and David Winkler and CC Head and Nigel since the very beginning is for this uh, organization to be an open book to the public. So we don't hide uh, behind the firewall and we won't tell what we do with your money. Rather, uh, we are going to uh, be engaged in a number of events and some of those uh, of you uh, that might be really interested in uh, understanding a little more about the science or our strategy we will be launching uh, quite soon some open houses as well we discussed a length uh, with Karen uh, recently some of the best way to do that so we could just to give you an example of what an open house would be we can organize uh, an event like the one we are having right now, but visiting a lab of a research uh, a scientist that we, have, we, we are supporting. And so that way you get a chance to ask directly uh, your uh, uh, experts uh, in that particular area that you care about, what is happening in their lab and what they are doing. And I think uh, that will uh, sort of uh, revolutionize uh, the way we support science. Because at some point, uh, one question that, for instance, I just got recently uh, uh, from a colleague uh, on the East Coast said, well, you know, I'm really excited about what you guys are doing, but what about mid-career investigators? Uh, so, well, we are not big enough for now to support the mid-career investigators, but in the, near, in the near future, when we'll grow, we'll have the opportunity to also offer some level of support to investigator of mid-career because if you think about it and that investigator when uh, he posed me that question was right in striking a point that is you know mid-career investigators are often a, a, a critical uh, critical players in the training of those young investigators that we are supporting so if we don't uh, provide any type of support to uh, the next generation then we may end up with uh, only a group of young investigators that may not be in the best possible environment to receive training and support. So this is something that eventually will happen in the future. But for now, for now of course, we need to grow and we need uh, as much support as uh, possible and as much uh, engagement and uh, interaction with the community. Thank you. And before I ask Cece what he thinks about that <clears throat> question, I would just add, we will be doing a Meet the Researchers event. We're hoping to do it in November in honor of World Diabetes Day and National Diabetes Awareness Month. But again, we're just slow to gather because we're just trying to make sure that it's safest for our community as possible uh, before it's in person. But I love that Vincenzo shared that. And there are a lot of ways for you to be involved as well. As you can tell in 2020, we weren't able to meet new people. <laughs> um, so if we have these virtual events, invite your friends. If you want to get on a call with any of us, we'd be happy to get on a Zoom and meet people and answer questions. Right now, it's just really about getting connected. And that's our main goal is getting our name out there, what we're doing and getting connected to people who want to hear more about it. So Cece, would you like to add to that as well? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I um, would like to put in a shameless plug as well. Um, that one of the important things that we can do and that we're looking for uh, as ways to get involved is we're going to be expanding our committees. And if you're really excited about what we're doing, there will be opportunities and openings on a number of different committees from the lay review committee that helps us translate complex science into terminology and um, concepts that are fairly easily understood to event planning to um, governance to all sorts of different things and I would like to encourage any and all of you who want to really become involved that this is a nice way to learn about this organization from the inside. We are happy to have as many people apply and come on over and help us out as possible because really we're still young enough and growing enough where we need external people to help us, and especially if they've got expertise in any of the fields. So please, as involved as you want to be, don't be bashful about asking because we're looking for all sorts of different people in all sorts of different roles. Thank you, Cece. And uh, we aren't gonna do our Dance for Diabetes in 2021 because we're gonna do an even bigger celebration in 2022 to celebrate our birthday. Um, but 
that is another way to get involved. Any event committee planning people, you can always contact me, but we really just want people involved in how they want to be involved with what we're doing, right? We don't want to just create roles. I think one thing you'll see about DRC is we're not going to hand you a pamphlet and say, here are your five opportunities of how you can get involved. We want to actually hear from you and say, how do you think that you could be involved and what are your strengths and what excites you? Because we're small and we're innovative and we really believe in connecting anybody to what we're doing in ways that excite them. So right now I'm going to ask one more question. I feel like you might have already answered this, Vincenzo and Cece, and even Karen, but what we, where there's a lot of questions around what's exciting in the research and T1D research, what's the latest and greatest news. Um, you guys both answered that, I think, to a T. So I would ask you to share on any projects that we have either in the pipeline um, that maybe aren't live on our website yet or that are that you think are really exciting and promising. So if either of you wanna share or Karen as well, is there anything that stands out to you that you think is is really exciting uh, as far as the future of T1D research goes? I'm yeah. definitely defaulting to the researchers here. <laughs> I mean, two uh, hot topics that come to mind. One is the recent announcement of uh, Vertex uh, being approved uh, for a fast track testing of stem cell derived uh, pancreatic islets uh, in a small group of uh, type 1 diabetic patients. We will uh, need to wait for the results. It was going to take a while, but that's exciting. Um, even though there is a lot of room for improvement in the field, we need to make better cells to go into people. Uh, we need better strategies to have these cells engraft properly and function, um, ideally without immunosuppression, because the trial I just mentioned that was announced early March this year will require immunosuppression, like for pancreatic islet transplantation. But that's exciting, meaning that we no longer, in the near future, we no longer will uh, rely only on organ donors for pancreatic islet tissue for transplantation, but also from a so-called unlimited source of uh, stem cells. That's exciting. Another uh, really hot topic that comes to mind is the work uh, that comes out of UCSF from the laboratory of uh, Dr. Anil Bouchan, who has identified a mechanism by which uh, the immune system is programmed to eliminate cells that are getting old, so-called the senescent cells. And it appears that when your immune system is unable to, uh, uh, to provide that function, uh, basically, if I may use a later uh, uh, analog analogy, is like if that trash collection service doesn't function well, okay, your household, your pancreatic islets, are going to be surrounded and populated by old cells. And that eventually that uh, appears to somehow be involved in the, in the initiation of type 1 diabetes. Uh, there are some exciting uh, observations in that front, suggesting that if you eliminate those cells that are towards uh, some sort of a functional demise because of, they are aging, then you prevent type 1 diabetes. Uh, diabetes, um, at least in an animal model. So, of course, there, there is a bit of a jump now to go in and test this in human uh, uh, subject, but I think the direction uh, that this is this new concept is taking is really exciting. I guess I'll throw in one that I like. Vincenzo mentioned a couple of the ones that have been interesting to me. Um, I've been a fan of Jing Hu's um, research, um, and she, what she is studying is um, halting a new signal to halt type 1 diabetes. And so as the, as, as a patient develops type 1, um, there are structural changes that happen in the beta cells. And one of the structural changes that seems to be happening is in... Um, a structure in an organelle called a cilia, which is a little hair-like structure that kind of acts as a receptor, a kind of weather vein that kind of tells you what's happening in the surroundings. So you, so what happens is you lose the ability or the ability changes for you to be able to detect what's happening around you. And if you lose cellular context, 
the cell doesn't know how to behave. Cells are like people and they need surroundings, they need each other, and they need signals from each other. If from nothing else to say, hey, I'm fine, I'm doing all right, or hey, something's wrong. And if you confuse that or change that, then what happens is the cell doesn't know how to behave and you start a really what winds up being a fairly self-destructive process. So understanding how the cells communicate with each other and understand what's happening outside of the cell. So if you think about a network neighborhood, so in other words, you've got a neighborhood where you've got houses, but a neighborhood isn't just houses, it's streets, it's roads, it's trees, it's everything else. And understanding how all of that works together to keep a neighborhood functioning is the same way that an islet neighborhood works. And understanding the breakdown in this process can be critically important for understanding how to stop this. Because if you can eliminate just one bad apple in this, you should be able to get the rest of the cells to go back to doing something else. And you know, anyone who knows me and has spent time talking to me knows that I like the ideas uh, of how the outside talks to the inside of the cells. And this is the latest on it. And I think that it's a really fascinating idea and a great project. Thanks, C. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly uh, right. And uh, as you know, uh, over the years when I was working with Alberto and with you, incidentally, we were looking exactly how, how you disrupt cell-to-cell -cell aggregation. Uh, you end up in uh, creating a, an environment for these cells that, uh, such that they no longer respond to glucose. Um, and what you mentioned is so exciting because, in fact, uh, the, some of the senescent observations uh, by the Bouchan uh, group does do relate to, to uh, what you just mentioned. And that's just one mechanism that the cell utilizes to, to probe constantly the environment and react to it or give instructions to its neighbors. That's really exciting. Yeah, I know that it, I know that it goes directly hand in hand with what you've been doing all these years. And so it's really um, gratifying to watch the field mature and watch these ideas develop and come into kind of a new, newfound respect for what we might be able to understand, accomplish, and manipulate. Okay, I received a couple more questions, so I'm not trying to silence you, <laughs> but I'm going to move on to the next. I love, again, the energy. Um, so really quickly, this one's a little off topic and I'm going to answer it and then I'm going to present another question to you, Cece and Vincenzo. Um, so this one is saying, how are you engaging the younger generation? Uh, so that is a really exciting question. I know we say social media, social media, but we are doing more than that. Um, one really innovative, creative new way is that we realize that we're having women ages 34, well, actually younger, I'll say 23, but one of the studies said 34 to 46 that were coming to our websites and looking at our, our newsletters. And it seemed like maybe they weren't finding the information that they wanted because they weren't staying as long as we had hoped um, visiting and, and looking at our information. We love sending out the latest T1D news in the field, but at the same time, we realize and maybe we need to be sending out some other information. So we started discussing diabetes with DRCs, T1Ds, and we have some type 1 diabetics that are on staff that are getting to share their stories. Hannah is incredible. If you don't know her, go look her up on our website. It'll be there in the next couple of days, our bios and profiles. Um, but it's really focusing on reading different articles from partner organizations and sharing their insight as a type one into chronic illness, into dieting, exercising, um, and how difficult that is at this age and this life stage. So it's really great. It's caregiving, there's there's recipes. And so we're excited to, to launch this and we've been receiving wonderful feedback. So that's one new way. Again, if you have ideas for us or perhaps you would like to write uh, a blog or you have some great ideas, we would love to connect with you and here, anything that you want to share. And we do want to also feature your story. So one of the things we love to do is to feature the stories of those with type one or who are impacted uh, with type one, if that's a caregiver or a family member. And we like to share those stories so that we can hear from one another and we can celebrate um, the progress and all that you are doing in your life today, but also hear where you've come and what your experience is. So that's that question. So the next question 
for Vincenzo and Cece is I might, I hopefully I get all this correct. Okay. Uh, Vincenzo and Cece, are you aware of the research into the potential for mRNA technology to prevent the progression of type 1 diabetes at the onset? I'm actually not very good at the acronyms. So what is this, that standing for? mRNA is what oh. I imagine that it is, oh. just, just messenger RNA. I see. So uh, there is a lot ongoing uh, in that front, but I don't know if uh, the person is asking specific questions about uh, the study. Uh, right. It, it, it is, can, can the question be asked a little differently? Do you mean- Yeah, so the clarification was, it's the same technology used for the vaccines. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, ahead, oh, I think that is a, a difficult uh, one to address because the messenger RNA, as uh, the, the word says, basically is simply the message to have the cell. Uh, if you put inside a cell, a specific messenger, which is like a code to tell the cell how to make a protein, uh, then you would get that cell, in this particular uh, case, I guess, uh, your beta cells, uh, tell what to do to make, start making, in other words, that protein. Or you could have that mRNA into lymphocytes to silence some genes that regulate autoimmunity. Uh, but that's a long shot. I'm not aware of any study that is actually uh, uh, of, of anyone looking at the exploiting that type of uh, technology, uh, because there are other ways to do that as well, exactly. uh, even more efficiently than uh, 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 sort of uh, using a, a, a backdoor to get into the cell, to convince that cell to make a new protein. Uh, so. Um, I'm not aware of any study uh, using that te te technology. Um, but uh, so let me follow up briefly yeah. as well on what Vincenzo said. So with uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, there's a specific target that they wanted to put in. That's the spike protein. So if you've got your Moderna or Pfizer or whatever vaccine or whichever of these mRNA vaccines, hopefully, um, you basically had that encased in a lipid nanodroplet that went into your cell and your cell began to make that specific protein, which then your immune system recognized and made antibodies to. In type one, what we'd have to do is we would have to have one or two specific targets like that, that we thought could be um, useful for eliminating the immune response, let's say. And because we think that there's pleiotropic effects of the immune system, we aren't really certain that this can be done with one or two mRNAs. Now, other people have been looking at exosomes and something called microRNAs that then silence production of a number of different proteins. Now, in that, what, what we're able to do is one microRNA can actually shut down and downregulate a lot of different proteins. So if you're able to target something like that, that then can hit lots of different proteins that can, say, for instance, stop senescence or, rever or increase proliferation, these are things that would be much more amenable to targeting in my mind. Thank you. That helps. Well, we have received a couple more questions, but I am going to actually close us out because this was a quick meet and greet. So hopefully we'll be able to have another follow on. Looks like we're getting more questions. So we might have to do a part two uh, in the future. So thank you so much to our panelists who joined us and thank you to everyone who is able to spend some time and meet our new team, our new leadership team. Again, we'll be sending an email. We'll be able to send all the links of the things that we've talked about today for you to get involved in any way you would like. Uh, if you'd like to meet with us as well, we'll be sending that out. And we will also send the recording, a link to this recording as well, if there's somebody you'd like to share it with. So thank you so much for your time. We're so grateful for your support and that you were able to attend tonight. And we hope that you had as much fun as we did. And at DRC, we believe it takes a community to connect for our cure and you're the community. So please stay connected. Thank you and thank have you. a good night. Thanks thank for you, everybody. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.